Welcome back to Believe in Badgers on the Believe Network, presented by BetOnline.ag and Oak Bridge Wealth Management. I'm Matt Perkins, joined as always by Badger legend, the Hebrew Hammer himself, Matt Bernstein. Bernie, yeah, how are you doing today? buddy. We're good. Fire sale on the Badgers, right? I'm joking. That's a joke. But uh, we'll, we'll get into all that stuff. Uh, uh, dude, every day is a holiday, and it happens to actually be a big holiday. So uh, happy New Year to both of you guys. It's, it's Rosh Hashanah today. And uh, I'll go out of my way to to do the podcast. I think um, my rabbi would say this is okay. (laughs) Well, we'll we'll, we'll get you out of the way so you can get to services, Bernie. Um, But we have returning guest. Uh, He was here for episode 27. He is back for episode 246. Uh, It is former Badger offensive lineman, a former Buffalo Bill, which warms my heart. Uh, Craig Urbit. Craig, it's so good to see you again. Good to see you guys. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Craig, I love seeing you, man. Love you just you, man. look amazing. I know. I missed what are you, you last doing in life. The last two uh, golf outings, I missed having you there. That's why you look so good. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> wow. Before we get into it, I want to remind everyone tuning in that we continue to be presented by betonline.ag. Bet Online is the world's most trusted betting platform and your number one source for everything football. Bet Online has every stat, every matchup, and even live odds and spreads to bet on during the games. If you really think you know your stuff, get in on the $200,000 Mega Contest and pick five games against the spread every week for your chance at weekly prizes and a share of that $200,000. When the game's over, head on over to the online casino, get in on a game of blackjack, poker, or unwind with over 150 different slot games. Head to the website today, that's betonline.ag, to get in on the action. Bet online, the game starts here. And... Of course, we continue to be proudly presented by our good friend, Chris Anasetti and his team over at Oak Bridge Wealth Management. If you are a current or future professional athlete or a collegiate athlete with NIL endorsements, Chris Anasetti is the man that you need to connect with to get your money right. Over at Oak Bridge, Chris and his team of professionals will create a comprehensive financial plan to set you up to navigate your lifestyle and future market conditions. They specialize in wealth management for professional athletes and understand all the pressures that you face every single day. Chris and his team will set you up with a bespoke plan to make your money work for you off the field so you can focus on what you do best, perform on the field. Get in touch with Chris on Instagram at OakbridgeWM underscore Anacete. That's OakbridgeWM underscore A-N-I-C-E-T-E. Or head on over to the website, OakbridgeWealthMGMT.com. That's Chris Anacete and Oak Bridge Wealth Management. So, Craig, obviously... Badgers are two and two. It's been up and down. There's been a lot of stuff going on. It seems like a lot of like outside, right? Like a lot of outside the locker room stuff. You're very vocal in some of the alumni groups. Mm -hmm. I will not quote you. I promise. And I actually don't think it's bad, but you know, from, from let's just dive right in. What are you seeing from the Badgers? Yeah. I mean, obviously the last two weeks aren't what, what they expected and what they, you know, wanted, but Again, look at two weeks ago, they played, or three weeks ago, I should say, played probably the number one team in the country, Alabama, you know, lost the starting quarterback in the what, sixth, seventh play of the, of the game. And that's tough to come back from. You know, you prepare the entire week with him as a starter and have someone who probably got, you know, 20% of the reps all week to all of a sudden be thrown in there against a defense like that. They're not going to have much, much success. And then you have off week and then – you know, first half of the USC game was encouraging. They're playing well, firing all cylinders, playing well. All of a sudden, went in a half. I don't know what adjustments were made, if any, but they came out and just – I know that's what a lot of the frustration is, you know, after a week off and then have some adjustments to come out and, you know, give up 28 un- unanswered points. It's kind of one of those concerning things you see, like, hey, where are the problems happening and – you know, where the concerns at, but I I think everyone freaking out on Twitter about the season, it's like they're, they're one game into the big 10 season. They just played two really, really good teams, probably the number one team in the country. You know, it's just kind of pump the brakes, take a step back and kind of regroup and head into the rest of the big 10 season uh, regrouped. But Craig, there, there are 
so I agree with you. I think we first off, you played two terrible teams to start, um, which doesn't help, and it didn't help when we played. Yeah, and then um, then you go against Alabama, which at that time was number four, probably number one now. That's a big jump. Have you ever experienced a jump like that in either college or the NFL, where you're playing almost bottom of the barrel to the top of the cream of the crop? Not that I can remember. I mean, we early on we played some, you know, we played the San Diego States and whatnot, and. To go against a team like Alabama, you know, we never went from, you know, one of our non-conference games to Ohio State or Michigan or you know, one of those teams. We always had, you know, probably a easier Big Ten opener, but that's a pretty daunting task going from San Diego State to Alabama in the span of a week. And, you know, obviously the injuries didn't help. And certainly in the NFL, it doesn't matter if you're playing the worst team in the NFL or the best team. As an old lineman, you're if you're going against a really bad team, you're probably going against a uh, number f- top five pick and D tackle or D end every single week, regardless. So you never had that jump. Every week was a daunting task, but um, yeah, it's definitely a challenge, and it's one of those things you, you hope to live up to. But obviously, the last couple of weeks have been you know falling flat. And Greg, you've been a part of a bunch of different teams, so. In my eyes, we should not have lost that game so badly. But that's what really good teams like Alabama do. They they beat you up. We lost to uh, USC, which I actually thought 21-10, almost into the fourth quarter. Yeah. And we just – but what do you see as the – team? like what is our, our Achilles heel? Is it like mistakes? Is it penalties? Like what is it? I think the biggest thing is third down. You look at the last two weeks, I think Alabama was over 60% of third down and Wisconsin was, I think, two of 10 on third down, something like that. And then USC, same thing. They were over 50% on third down. I think the biggest thing is not playing. you seen the first half of USC. I thought they were playing pretty loose play calling and everything, all of a sudden, second half, they kind of started playing a little more conservative, you know, third and short, running the ball, knowing that Wisconsin was probably going to run the ball. You know, I think you need to st- still take the shots on third and short or take the longer routes on third and short and kind of keep keep the game open. Um, you know, the fourth and short versus them was, you know, they had three on block guys off the edge. You need either get a better play call or call timeout and regroup or whatever. But that and then the Alabama game, I think, um, uh, Locke missed a few wide open throws that should have been caught. You know, there's, I remember, I think second or third quarter, there's, you know, a wide open guy down the field, missed him by five, 10 yards, something like that. You know, that's a, he had, if it's a walk in touchdowns, a, you know, different change of the game, different, you know, momentum swings. So, um, but I think both Wisconsin's offense has not been able to stay on the field in third down, and Wisconsin's defense has not been able to get off on third down. I think Wisconsin's defense needs to get better pressure, especially from the front guys a lot of their sacks this year have been from linebackers coming you know on blitzes so you know they got to change some things up and just try to get generate more pressure on third down so let, let's focus on the offense since that's where you and i played mm-hmm. is do you, i mean you think it's the quarterback yeah i mean, it's a lot of different things you know you can look at how they've been playing i think a little bit's the quarterback obviously you have a new kid in there you know you don't have your your started from the beginning of the season I think the receivers are playing pretty well it's I think it's a lot of different things it's a quarterback I think the um the play calling stuff like that just needs needs to get a little bit better especially you know if you got a third and short you know I saw a lot of times last year and this year third and short we're running shotgun you know these offset zone plays that are just you know taking time to develop it's like sometimes you just need to either, you know quarterback sneak or get someone like Bernie in there, a little fullback dive, and uh, to get you the two or three hard yards that you need. I've been waiting for the fullback belly to come back for a yeah. minute, but I, I doubt that it is. Um, so, Craig, but so this offense, um, what can they rely on? We've been doing this segment here called Hang Your Hat On It, presented by Melon, the world's most durable cap. Go check it out, melon.com, M-E-L-I-N.com. <laughs> Craig, in your opinion, what can the Wisconsin offense hang their hat on right now? I think their own line. I think their own line's playing really well. I think they're protecting very well. They but protected very well versus USC and Alabama. I didn't look at the stats, but I know they very few hits and sacks and stuff. And I think you gotta hang your hat on them. You know, if you gotta start bringing in another, you know, a sixth old lineman to play kind of like a bulk tight end or you know playing twelve personnel and bringing in guys like that and start doing that instead of you know 
you know, four wide or, you know, the 11 personnel all the time. I think you need to change it up. I think you see some of these teams like Michigan or whatever, they're able to go spread, but also bring in some extra guys, some bigger, bulkier tight ends or like an extra line or a lineman and start running that power stuff, you know, and I think that's starting to need to start changing up to that too. I actually love that opinion, Craig, because it makes sense on that fourth down we had, we literally had no other option but give and everyone was coming to dinner. Yeah. Well, and Hold on, the fire department's going by. Well, that's fine, though, because you, you mentioned the stats, Craig. I have the stats. Mm-hmm. They allowed three pressures. That's in 27 dropbacks, three yeah. total pressures in that game, whereas uh, Wisconsin got 14 pressures in 51 dropbacks on, on USC. Now, mm-hmm. Wisconsin didn't close, right? They didn't close very well on defense, turning pressures into sacks, but they were at least getting there. Wisconsin's offensive line held up as well as I can remember. I think there was one penalty on Jack Nelson, I want to say sometime in the third quarter, that yeah. uh, that was a bit of a rough one. But besides that, they played a clean ball game, and I agree with you that uh, not only are they the unit that the Wisconsin can hang their hat on, but I think they're uh, it's – you know, the hiring of Coach Blazek has sure, paid yeah. immediate dividends. Have you had a chance to meet him at all? Or, or have you noticed anything like watching this line that is the reason for such a big improvement from last year to this year? Yeah, definitely. I've never met him before. Uh, I knew of him. Um, but yeah, he seems like he's been doing a really good job from a couple of people I know kind of around um, the team. They said that they, you know, the players love him. He's doing a great job in there and in the locker room. I think that's huge to have someone like that. You know, the O line obviously is a, you know it's the foundation of your offense. You need to have the consistent play from them in order to have a chance. And I think they've been playing consistent. They've been playing well. I just need you know, like I said, I'm a old you know 22 fullback and two tight end you know type of type of guy. So I like to see a little bit more of those heavier sets and start. You know, I think we have some good quality backup players too to get in there and get some extra playing time at those positions. You could also run the shotgun from 22 set. Yeah, for sure. You oh, yeah. can't do these things. For sure. Um, Matt Perkins, Casey Rybacks, Rybacks there. Yeah. So like, how, it must be so great that they have two fantastic coaches to be part of this team. I actually completely agree with you. I think they are the most improved unit. For sure. Sadly, I'm a little nervous in my backs, but um, we could talk about that in a second. But, I think they're the most improved. I mean, they went against a number one defensive line out of Alabama. Yeah. And to me, played almost up to as physical as they oh, were. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, you watched that game. You didn't see them getting out physical by Alabama at all. And I thought they played play well. And that's, that's the thing they have to go forward. It can't be, you know, trying to scheme with all the re- these receivers and everything like that. It has to be the, that O-line up front has to lead them for sure. I'll tell you one thing, though, at least for me, maybe it's because I've just been so brainwashed by 30 years of Wisconsin football. But if you're going to have one elite unit on your offense, it might as well be your offensive line because that's sure. where it's all going to build from. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm excited about the back. So like you said, Bernie, like I think the top two are playing pretty. So I think they need to start getting some of these young guys in there, too. I think you saw some of the plays they're making in camp. You know, they're more than just running backs. They're just kind of weapons, you know, being able to get them on the edge and like playing in slot and stuff like that. I think they need to start getting those guys in the field too. But I think it's tough though. Cause they're trying to like, they've been trying to rotate five backs yeah. as it goes. And I don't, I think you're going to see as the Badgers get into 10 pl- big 10 play Bernie, that it's going to be three guys taking, it's got to be taking the lion's share of the snaps. I don't think you can keep guys in rhythm when you're trying to rotate that many players yeah. in. Well, that's, that's what I'm, I'm most nervous about the running backs. If we're talking about off the quarterback is consistent to me. Right, I, I think um, Braden Locke will give you okay play. I would love to see him take shots down the field to make him better, to like to elevate my scorecard, I guess. And I think he can do that. I think he's got a good enough arm. He's not going to throw ninety yards, but he can make those plays happen. And he should take them because why not? There's just no reason not to. I'm nervous because when I watch, you know, Craig, we've been on teams with three, four backs. You you either find the guy who's playing hot and you stick with that dude yeah. to keep him hot. Or you're searching for the next hot guy. And it just, to me, it's weird to have guys play four snaps and then not play for the rest of the game. Yeah. And I don't, I'm, I guess in my brain, this is also me being a couch potato, like searching up to like, why are we doing that? We have Ches Malusi, we have Ty Wee, who I think is great, do pre came off, we have Yakimelli, we have Jackson Aker, we have two, maybe too many dudes. Yeah. Craig, what, what's, it just makes me nervous to say, 
why are we putting so many guys in the game? Every like, every time I've been, yeah, every time I, every team I've been on, it's been one one back was the main back. You know, my first year starting Brian Calhoun was the guy. He was the guy the entire year. He got the lion's share. Then after that, PJ Hill for how many years? You know, and then you had every single year it was Jonathan Taylor, Monty Ball. I mean, that different. That was a little bit different because they had James Wade, a freak show at linebacker. You know, between Gordon and White and all those guys, Monty Ball. But I think you need to have you need to figure out who your main guy or two guys are, and they're taking ninety percent of the reps. It has to be that, and getting more consistent play from that. Like you said, you can't have one guy playing one series for four or five plays and the next guy playing. And that, you, as a back, I don't know, like, I mean, you played more back than uh, I did, obviously, but <laughs> like you can't get, can you get in a rhythm, you know, only playing every, you know, f- four or five plays every 15, 20 plays on offense. I, I, I can't imagine you can. So they need to find that back that they're going to put their, you know, they said hang their hat on and go with them for, for the whole game. I, I do imagine, <clears throat> excuse me. I do imagine if they found three guys, and we're like, we're going to – to me, the only way guys got elevated up the depth chart during the season was practice, not in a game. Yeah. I mean, we when I when I first showed up, it was AD, Jerome Pettis, and I think Broderick Williams. It could have been somebody else. But those two dudes got the entire – I mean, those two guys played the whole time. Yeah. And then after that was AD, Dwayne Smith, and Booker Stanley. Mm-hmm. And the drop after that was pretty dr- drastic. Yeah. And then it was me after those guys. So, like – that you know, the thing is, talk about a precipitous drop. No, that's not I a mean, huge, drop. huge drop. Everyone uh, remembers the Penn State game when you were hurdling dudes and over 100 and something, 130 yards. 20, uh, 20 years ago reason, this week. 20 years ago this week. Ago. The only reason that I was able to do that was because our O line was probably one of the best to ever play. I mean, yeah. every, every one of those guys played in the league. Um, and Joe Thomas is one of the best players to ever play. Bar none. Yeah. And we ran his way pretty much the entire game. If you watch, I watched the film recently because I'm washed up. We ran to Joe Thomas the whole time. Neither here nor we're not talking about me. I just get nervous because they're searching. And for me, it's you do that stuff at practice. You want to pre to get reps. Ches Malusi doesn't need to see more reps at practice. That dude has played enough football, right, Craig? Like in the NFL, yeah. these dudes don't need to see the, yeah. the the practice field. They need to see. They need to be fresh. Tyree Walker does not need to practice to me i mean he needs to practice but not get the reps if you were looking for other guys you put dupree in for 50 plays on offense during practice and see if he's ready yeah. and the same with the other guys i agree it, it's dude imagine if you rotated guards and tackles you never get the feel you never you feel for the that. d lineman it would be crazy it does. Yeah. so as you can see i'm a little i might i just had a celsius i'm a little too jacked up um <laughs> I, I just – I think all those guys are really good football players. I just don't get the, the the mentality of let's play five or six guys and have a freshman play four plays who I actually think could be really good. It's just – it just doesn't make sense. That's – so, Craig, when you watch the games, do you – I've been finding myself watching offense going, I just don't understand some things. Yeah. I, I, like I said, I – same with – like I said, what we come out with running back, you have that bell cow in there that's taken – or the two, you know, you have Chez and, and Tyree, you know, like you had those two guys taking 90% of the reps. The fact, like you said, that's the fact that they say have a third or a fourth in there. It's like, this shouldn't be happening. You know, if they're a third or fourth for a reason, maybe you don't see the field as, as well as the first two guys, well, then they shouldn't be in there all the time. They should have the first two guys in there taking all the reps, getting the yards, like they're veterans. They should be in there most of the time. You know, if those two freshman running backs that, you know, they're very high on, obviously they're true freshmen, they're going to have their time at some point, but maybe this year isn't the year. And I think, you know, it's it's exciting to think about, but right now in, in terms of winning, you want to have just those bell cows up there getting up the line share of the, of the yards. At and the same Maverick, time, though, I, I would say that you could argue that Dupree has looked as good as, as in his limited touches as the true freshman as – you know, as anyone else, he, he runs hard. He makes yards after yeah. contact. He's making guys miss. Like, I think that, you know, in, in some ways he's been more effective than the guys higher up on the depth chart 
than him, even if they are older guys who are more experienced. And I think that as we get into Big Ten play, like we said, Bernie, like it's going to take, um, you know, it's like it's like going it's like in the NBA, you know, you like pare down your playoff rotation in the regular season. You're playing 10 or 11 guys. By the time you're getting deep in the playoffs, you're playing seven guys, like maybe an eighth guy, a couple minutes. But, you know, you're shortening the roster. Right? And I feel like that's what is going to have to happen, especially in the running back room for the Badgers. And I would also say at no point in time, even when we were playing, were you a sure bet to win? So yeah. you have your best guys play until I remember running. I was so mad. We were up. Must have been Matt Perkins. You can probably Google this. It was in the 40s to like 10 against UNC, I think, in either 03. It would, literally, it's got to be 40 to 7, 40 to 10. Something where the, with like two minutes left. They could not have scored enough points. We're on like going in on the 20 and I jog up. They call 21 and I jog off the field. And um, Coach Mason, like, Bernie, get the f- out there. And I was like, Coach Mason, Greg Root's going in. <laughs> I'm like, dude, I'm done for like, this. Because also, get, let Greg play a little bit. Like, yeah, yeah. This is not, like, this is not serious time. And, uh, dude, they, they were so mad at me. And I was like, I'm just not going back out there. Put, put on a fullback. And you don't, you don't need me to go in there. The game is over. But at no point up until that point, Matt Perkins, what was the score? 35 to 20. Oh. At U- UNC at home in the, 2000? The final score of the game was 38 to 27, Saturday, September 20th, 2003. Ooh. I've been hitting the head too many it times. Just felt like, yeah. So, yeah. what about 04? We didn't play them in 04. You did not play them in 04. We played them in 05. Wow. We were there. We played them in 05 there, and we beat them 21 to 17, 24 Something to 17. Something like that. I remember that was like a, a three-hour rain delay. And it was the, we just played so poorly, though. I, but, played, I played terrible. Yeah, I, I didn't play very good either. <laughs> you know who played good? Brian Calhoun. Thank yeah, God for yeah. him. Uh, but what I'm saying is, like, with two minutes left in the game, and we're running power and, like, other things, I was like, just put Greg in. Like, we're, we're not going to lose this game. Yeah. But up until that point, like, it's a fist fight. I think we got to play our best guys. You don't take dudes out. They don't do in the NFL. You're watching your top guys play until the fourth quarter. There's no and, – and at no point – I mean, I, I guess at halftime to go in there and say, it's 21-10, we're winning or we're going to win. To me, I've said this before, and nobody kind of agrees with me except, Craig, you mentioned it. I don't think they're doing any halftime adjustments that are that are meaningful. It didn't and look like – especially in the USC game, it didn't look like anything was, was made, any kind of adjustment. It was just – like they came off so flat – and obviously the punt fumble, punt return fumble, that like killed it. But like they came off so flat, and I don't know what they were trying to do on offense. You're just looking at it just like what is going on? Like there was zero momentum, zero. It just obviously that's, that's where all the rumblings are coming from. I think from the outside is just guys seeing that halftime adjustment after a week of of extra time to prep and kind of just confused. Like what is going on? Like where is the where is this? Where are we going? What is what is going on? So I want to ask you guys, when, when you're playing, you know, college, NFL, what was your like routine at halftime for your body? Were you like trying to like, hydrate with anything specific? Were you trying to like getting certain foods in your body for the second half as well as obviously like preparing for the second half, like mentally and in a game plan kind of way? You have, yeah, you obviously you go and have a snack. You kind of try to get your feet off the, you know, get your, put your feet up, uh, sit in a chair, just sit down. Some guys What's your go-to there. snack? What was your go-to snack? Uh, they had a bunch of these really good, like protein bars that like the, wherever they are, just, you know, 400, 500 calories just to get some, some, uh, stuff in you, but hydrate, you know, go to the bathroom and kind of regroup coaches after they meet for a little while, they come in and tell you what, you know, what we're seeing, what we're maybe going to see going forward um, and kind of the plays that we were going to start to keep doing and kind of keep hitting. And um, they kind of go over that kind of stuff. And for me, it's like, as an old lineman, I'm like, sure, whatever, whatever you call a pass play, run play, I'm going to do the same thing regardless. So it doesn't matter if you call 20 powers in a row or 20 (laughs) passes in a row, I have to do it. So it's like, whatever. You know, it's different from our, obviously a quarterback's different because he's going to be, learn, you know, knowing, you know, checks and what kind of coverages are going to be doing this and that. For me, it's like, you know, that didn't matter as much. You know, if I was a center, I was a center in the NFL, I was in charge a lot of the time of protection. So, you know, we'd probably try to figure out some of the blitzes they had success on. They try to come back to, you know, if we missed, you know, if we missed a, a pressure and got a sack, 
you know, what, what we need to do differently, stuff like that. But it was kind of just regrouping. It wasn't too chaotic, but it was definitely kind of uh, heightened of what you need to get done. You know, it, I always found it interesting because they put the chairs out and you sat like almost in, in the row of like the starting second team and the rest of the dudes got away. Oh, like, yeah, it seemed like lockers. they were in their lockers or standing way back. And it was, you know, what's actually, it was, to me, it was weird. It was like, you know, I, I would just chug a lot of Gatorade, um, most likely do another like a pre-workout or another um, spark. Gun pop. I didn't eat anything because I would, I would throw it up. It was the only time I really did Powerade because I, it, got, it made my mouth too dry and then go to the bathroom. Because I always had to had to pee so bad from drinking so much, but you'd sit there and just chill, Craig. You're right. Get off your feet. Your feet. My feet would kill because you know you'd have your cleats with a metal, and you couldn't walk on anything that your feet yeah. were super comfortable. Yeah. Chill, and then literally, dudes were just chilling out, like you look just complete, almost like it was quiet. It's not as chaotic as people think. People think like you and they're like, oh, we need this, this, and like kind of running around. It's like it's not really that much. Coaches are in the back room clapping, and I was with Pitt for, the, for a couple of years, helping out with uh, Charlie Partridge. He's a D-line coach at Wisconsin too. And when the coaches all get together at halftime, they're, that's chaos. It's, you know, you're going over what, you know, the formations they had, what are they running those formations, you know, the passing, like what, like all the stuff, it was chaos. And, but when they came out and presented to the players, it was more, structured calm this is what we're doing this is what we're seeing this is what we're going to do and it was more calm so it's definitely there's two kind of two sides of every halftime but in the actual locker room when the players are getting together it's like it's chill it's kind of just trying to regroup and relax a little bit a lot of oh, i was saying like a lot of high five it was like class it almost seemed like class these guys you had like seven tas would come in and then yeah. each talk and it wasn't chaotic because i don't think they wanted that mindset yeah, I, I never, you know, sometimes like Cubes would be talking and and uh, B White would be talking, right? Like sometimes, but talking Cubes to their yelling. groups, Cubes would be yelling. I mean, but it, it they were, you know, to me they were very good at figuring out like, hey, power's working. If or hey, Tony, wash that guy down, Matt, go next guy. Like they were figuring out yeah. the chess pieces For on sure. what to do. Um, and but then there's a time to get it fired back up, and I think that we were able to a lot of times get fired up. Listen, the pendulum swung all the time. That's what Barry said. But coming out at halftime, like, dude, I was so excited to be back out there. I'm like, man, this is the this is it. Like, we can win this game. There's nothing better than getting on a flight for four hours after yeah. a game, a winner, because you could do almost anything you wanted. I mean, it's not like Michael Jordan on you know on that show, but. It, it was nice. You could eat as many cookies as you wanted. At oh, the yeah. end. Well, and, um, and Bernie, for that yeah. recovery, if you are on any NFL team or 66 out of 67 Power Four conference teams, you will find Cherubundi nice. Tart Cherry Juice. Natural products and ingredients, no added sugar. Tart Cherry Juice has, has the highest antioxidant fruit of any fruit and vegetable in the world. Natural anti-inflammatory, reduce soreness, increase recovery, uh, help support immunity with Cherubundi cherubundi.com i'm not gonna lie bernie i'm getting hooked on this it's stuff. It delicious stuff. Dude, it's it, so good Craig, you, you you drink a lot you drank uh, it a lot too i don't drink it a lot right now but when we, at wisconsin yeah, i felt they had stuff all around that's in terms of recovery and everything else that stuff was great i loved it yeah it's i, I i'm with you man it's it, it's it's i'm like getting i love the taste of it i think I, mentally it makes me uh like my joints hurt less just because i'm drinking it, i'm like oh my ankle doesn't hurt so bad this week yeah. but it, uh, who knows? But I, 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 first of all, it tastes amazing. It does. Oh my goodness gracious! It's like it's very good. It's like yeah. Coors Light at, at post five p.m. I, I, I don't know if we're, I don't know if we're allowed to legally endorse a Cherubundi and uh, with a Coors Light chaser or not. But um, either way, uh, we recommend going to Cherubundi.com or find Cherubundi <laughs> pretty much anywhere groceries are sold near you. Um, so, Craig, let's let's look forward a little bit here. Badgers have Purdue this week and Purdue is struggling uh, this season. What do you need to see out of Wisconsin this weekend and over the next couple of weeks to give you confidence in the team moving forward? Yeah, obviously Purdue's struggling. You know, they're not playing well. They have a good special teams right now, but I think they're struggling offense, defense. But you need, to see, you need to see a Wisconsin team come out and just try to dominate the entire game. It can't be like a, oh, you know, it's kind of they're up by seven, they're up by four for most of the game. They got to go out and just dominate. 
you know, when you, when you, you know, smell blood in the water as a shark, you have to go in and you're just going to eat ravis- ravisly. You know, you have to go in and produce not playing well. You have to go dominate them. And you have to get some momentum, some confidence going forward in the big time play. Because then a week after that, it's Rutgers and Rutgers is playing really well. And it's at home. It's at uh, at Rutgers. So you need to have some momentum going into that game. You get a couple in a row, all of a sudden you start building that confidence, building the momentum going th- forward for the rest of the Big Ten season. But from a from a team perspective, they need to go out this week and just absolute dominate Purdue. And and uh, Craig, what you said, I think the O line can if they do it, we're we're going to win. I think third downs is what you said. To me, it's short yardage. We have been struggling short yardage yeah. all over last year and this year. And and listen, there's been so much wacky stuff online everywhere about the fourth and one call people are up in arms i am a little bit too but you know like sometimes we've gone for fourth and one we haven't gotten it 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 does happen Mm -hmm. um i do think there are ways to do it but short yardage in general we have to stay on the field as an offense it's the only way you hold teams to not scoring and you keep our defense fresh and we have to as an offense you we got to get back to whatever we can figure out to stay on the field. Yeah. And the last, like I said, the last couple of weeks of third down on offense have not been good at all. They need to stay on the field and you keep our defense off the field. And just, if you need to get two more alignment in there as a, you know, a bulk heavy package, you need to get that and just start running it. Put someone at full, put one of those guys at full back and lead the way and just fall forward for, you know, two or three yards. Then you start doing that. And um, I think that'll be, Huge, just be able to convert a couple of those third and short stay on the field. Bring back the barge. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, for me, you talk about third downs on offense. I want to talk about third downs on defense because what did USC convert like 10 of 14 or something like that? Like it was yeah. bad. What do you think is it, and c- against USC? It wasn't just because they were third and one, third and three. These were third and sevens, third and tens that while we know Wisconsin was getting pressure, they weren't getting home. What do you think is the, is the reason that they've struggled with third down defense so much? Like you said, I think being able to finish those, those pressures, you know, they're getting close if the I think if the back end can hold a little bit longer, we give the front seven a little more time to give, be able to get there. But disguising uh, coverages, you know, being able to kind of disguise those things a little bit better, um, be a little more creative on on, on the pressure and win those one on one. You know, some of the times, some of those guys up front have to win the one on ones quickly to get to get the pressure and get the guy to throw quicker and make uh, worse decisions. But I just think they needed, to get, especially the longer downs, they need to be able to hold up. In the, in the back end to be able to get off the field. I mean, that's just the last couple of games have not been good enough. And and I'm I, we're, we're offensive guys, so I'm blaming the offense. I mean, they held the yeah. ball. We had 20 minutes of time possession. Mm-hmm. So you're giving USC third down opportunities. that you, you never see 14, 15 third downs. You see nine or eight or nine. Like mm-hmm. that, We gave them five or six more third down opportunities, and they took advantage of them. And I, I blame the offense because we did not hold the ball. We weren't on the field enough. Um, and I, I think that is what we – I think our, our struggle is outside of special teams because getting a penalty on the first play like just really drives me bananas. Um, as an offensive – listen, we weren't – Craig, we weren't in the best offensives that ever played in Wisconsin. In 2004, we were like one of the worst. But we won nine games because we had the best defense. Yeah. But we, we were on the field. We didn't score a ton, but we we were – we ate up so much clock. For sure, season. Yeah. I just think we, as an offensive unit, we got to be on the field and we got to give our defense a break and we got to have the opportunity to move the ball and get first downs. Yeah, they have okay. to stay on the field. Like you guys, I mean, that's, that's the name of the game on offense is stay on the field. That's how you yeah. score points. Um, so I want to just bring up, I, I found this one article and I think that you you probably get a lot of text messages. You hear a lot of things. The football alumni is going bananas. I don't know if that's a hundred percent true. If they're all going like absolute bananas, I think people are like saddened maybe to see the program where it is, where it was when, when people played, I could feel that. Do you think I read an article also kind of wild, but do you think that fickle owes any explanation to the Badger football alumni? No, I don't think Coach Fickle needs to address anything about the, you know, alumni are going to go on Twitter and, and, you know, talk and whatever, but I don't think he owes anything. I think, you know, this is his second year. 
I think he needs time for his recruiting class to come in and, and do work. Um, I think a lot of the criticism that's probably warranted is, you know, you bring in high profile office coordinator promising this air raid offense. And they're what I said on Twitter too, they're passing for fewer yards now than when we were a power running team, which is like, you, you, that doesn't even register to some people. It's like we're passing for fewer yards a game. And that's just, to me, it's like, if you're going to change your entire philosophy on offense, it, it, it better work. Like you, it better work. And it's it, so far that it hasn't been the past year and a half. And so I think that's one of the biggest rumblings is, is just seeing that. And so obviously it's different nowadays because when you would change schemes, like say like when Michigan went from Lloyd Carr to Rich Rodriguez or whatever what his name is, they went from like a power running team to a spread team and it didn't work. And some of the early failures that they had is because they had younger, like Rodriguez's younger quarterbacks playing. Well, nowadays, because of the transfer portal, last year you had a highly coveted re- quarterback come in to run your offense, didn't work. This year you had a highly coveted quarterback come in to run your offense, wasn't working. So it's like at some point you have to look at it and say, when is it going to work? You know, you're getting in some of these good recruits, you know, you have a good young quarterback coming into play. When are you going to turn it over to him? When are you going to, you know, like, it's it's different nowadays because of the transfer portal. So it's like at one point you're saying this is not working. Something needs to change. I don't think it's yet. I think they need to have more time. But they have the players in there. Like they've, they've had better receivers in there that they probably have ever had at this program. They've had better running backs. They've had better, you know, everything. So it's like as an alumni, you, you see that and you say, all right, you changed philosophies. Let's see it start working. And I think that's where a lot of the rumblings have been going on. But I think it's I, – I like Coach Fickle. I think he's doing a great job. I think he's bringing in, in better recruits. He's bringing in good recruiting classes. It needs a little bit of time for, him, for them to start playing. But, you know, I just think – I don't think he owes anything to the to the alumni. I think guys just need to calm down. We're two, two games in – or two four games in the, in the, in the year – two against the better teams that we've seen in a long time, you know, I think just you need know, to calm down, let the year play out and just the sky's not falling. You know, I think we <laughs> Purdue, you, you get another win versus Purdue or, you know, we're three and two back on the train. You know, I think it's just kind of do we need to calm down, give a little bit of time. And um, I think it'll be better from here on out. And, and Matt Burke is just to piggyback on that. I completely agree. Fickle owes me no explanation. No. Um, guess what? The year after I graduated uh, and Barry left and Coach B took over, who I actually was with on the team for a couple of years, didn't owe me an explanation either. Like that guy wasn't going to call me or text me or say anything like, oh, we, you know, we, we lost or whatever. Dude, I was thinking about this the other day. I'm like, Fickle doesn't owe me anything. No head coach ever owed me any explanation about what's going on in the team. Because why should they? I mean, not saying Fickle has no relationship. I actually really like him. I think there's also, you know, I think there's some issue with if it was Gary Anderson, then Fickle, we have no problems. We're very happy about it. It happened to be a very bizarre transition. Yeah. And and I still think there's some people. There's still, there's still some resentment it. there. There's still for some sure. resentment. I would say that, you know, for me, I am very saddened by it because I'm a huge Jimmy Leonard fan, but we didn't do it. So I'm like, you got to go forward. I, I can't just turn around and look backwards. Like we got to move forward. And I agree with you, Craig, things are not working out the way I, I guess everyone thought they would be. And same on defense, you know, like we just don't look like a high caliber offensive defense yet. But again, Barry had three or four years before he won the, uh, his first Rose bowl, his first year, the way they go two and two and 10, one in oh, 12. Like, one, ten, one in 10, I want to say. So one, like, I mean, one, one nine and one. One nine and one, I think. So is one nine and one. I would be more embarrassed to tie a team than to uh, lose to that team. But, um, but see, like, so like nobody remembers Barry coming in and having two, three bad seasons. For sure. And we have to, you know, the name social media and the whole, you see, you can read a thousand articles a week on the Badgers. Bernie, you were right. It was one in 10. One in 10. We didn't, we didn't, I'm just happy we lost instead of tied. I think dying is like the worst thing that could ever happen. Um, don't get me started on 
uh, participation trophies yet. <laughs> Although I love when my, my daughter gets a trophy for whatever she does. It doesn't matter what it is. Um, so, th- I mean, I guess that's my rant. We, you got to give these guys time. They got to get recruits. The transfer portal, the NIL, all these things are new. And it throws a huge wrench in trying to build a program. Because, again, Greg, you're right. We, we brought in Mordecai. He did okay. But he's not a he's not going to be a program guy. He's going to be a team guy. Like he he's there for one year. Then the next year, it's it, dude. It's the NFL. If you don't have a quarterback, you're just getting another guy. Yeah. Um. And it to me, it seems impossible to build a team off of bringing dudes in. I actually thought Van Dyke was going to be extremely competitive this year. That's with, yeah. the, with the talent around him and how good the O line's playing right this second. For sure. He just stepped wrong. Like it sucks. It wasn't like someone's fault. He yeah. just stepped wrong and it happened. With him at the helm. I think we're, you know, I think everything's a little bit different and and that sucks, but that's when a guy like Braden Locke says, you know what, I'm going to be that dude and I'm going to have to step out of my comfort zone and I don't know, be that guy. Guys get opportunity. I mean, at any level, college or pro, you know, guys get opportunities because someone in front of me got hurt. That's how I, in the, in the pros, I was a backup and guy in front of me got hurt. I got my opportunity to go in and I, you know, started for how many years after that. It's just, you got to be ready when a guy goes down, you know, guy, you have to be ready to go back in like you're the starter. And, you know, in terms of, you know, giving guys chances, to coaches, like I like Fick. I, I, I've met him a couple of times. I have a good conversation with him. He's a good, good, good dude. I think he's doing a good job. Look at what like Harbaugh, how many years it took him to get from, you know, alumni were at his throat for two, three years in a row. He couldn't beat Michigan state. He couldn't beat Ohio state. All of a sudden he got, you know, three, four, five years of his recruits in there changes how the program was run and all of a sudden they started having major success. So I just think, like I said, long story short, he doesn't know anything that anyone, you know, he needs to go in there, keep, keep coaching his team up and uh, getting these wins. And um, I'm looking forward to the rest of the season. Um, I think it'll be good. And you know what? I, I actually love that. And I think no matter if you like it or don't, we have to support the program Yeah, and all this other stuff you know, we didn't deal with it. There was no social media. I mean, Facebook came out and you couldn't do anything on it. And if you read one of four, three articles, Matt Perkins, right? Like the Daily Cardinal, the journal. Bernie, Bernie, you are underestimating the power of the poke in the original Facebook, first of all. No, you no, I'm not underestimating you, you, the poke. You can't say no, we no, did no, nothing no. with the with the original Facebook. We can, Sorry, we can, can poke, poke and write on walls. And it was completely inappropriate. And you but can, it was... You feel that poke come through <laughs> on you. Every dance I went to, I'm like, don't poke, don't poke. And uh, guess what? There's a – sorry. There's a, there's there's a, a lot of people listening. On you. I'm sorry, you. Gary. Uh, um, wait, no, but where was I going? Yeah, you were using there's, like, there's like three or four papers that might you be could read right. negativity you in three papers. or four. You got the Wisconsin State it. Journal. Like, yeah. Yes, yeah. but now you can read it in – 25 different places and listen to and it here with us or with other, or with other badger podcasts. more positive than a lot of other people. And listen, I'm not all blaming all anyone. Your opinion's your opinion. I just think we need to support the program. Like I was at Gary Anderson's initial, like um, meet and greet, right? Like I didn't, I have nothing to do with hiring these people. Like what am I going to do? Yeah. And, and you know what? You can only support and, and that's it. Yes. You can not like coaches and people, but you have to support the program or else it's going to be a debacle. Yeah, for sure. No, I agree. Oh, I'm like blacking out from not breathing from talking so much. Matt Perkins, ask Craig a question. Craig, I have a question for you. Yeah. How hard is it to be like on the sidelines knowing that at any chance you could go in? And how hard is it to be like just prepared for that? It's t- it's tough because I, I, it wasn't tough during the week because I always prepare whether I was the backup or the starter. I always prepared like – I'm one play away from being the starter for the rest of the season. You know, I've been in situations where I've seen a guy go down the first game of the year in the NFL, a guy go down the first game of the year, all of a sudden his backup, who probably wasn't thinking he's going to get more than 20, 30 snaps in a year, all of a sudden he's playing 1,000 snaps, playing 15, 16 games. And you have to be prepared for that. You absolutely have to. And I always, during the week, I made sure when I was towards the later end of my career and I was a backup, you know, center – I made sure I knew the ins and out of the offense of the blitzing of the calls just as good as the starting center. Cause if I go in and all of a sudden I'm not doing as well, or I don't know what I'm doing, I'm letting the entire team down cause I'm not preparing. So during a week, it was just making sure I'm on 
preparing as much as I can. So when I did have that opportunity to go in, I wasn't really nervous because I know I knew what I was doing and I knew my abilities and what I can do. So it's not, it wasn't very stressful for me, you know, doing that kind of stuff. I just always knew I was always ready to go. You're muted, Matt Perkins. Your dogs are Greg, uh, listen, they've been working way too much during this entire podcast. <laughs> They're on the naughty list today. Uh, Craig, you were doing some work with uh, Pitt, the Pitt Panthers, for a while. I know. What was your experience on sort of the coaching side of college football? It was cool. I mean, I was kind of just helping Charlie out with some, uh, you know, odds and ends stuff when he was a D-line coach here at Pitt. Um, it was cool, you know, look, looking, uh, kind of breaking down some – the protection schemes from some of the other uh, the old, the old lines we were facing, um, kind of like some uh, some of their tells, just kind of doing some odds and stuff for them. Um, in a couple of years, obviously it was it was exciting, it was kind of cool. Thought maybe maybe getting into it, but um, took a pause last year. Um, my wife got uh, stage three breast cancer last summer, and so obviously last all of last year and a lot of this year just been kind of you know going through the ins and outs of that, and so. Um, we're on the other end, thankfully, and now I'm actually on the coaching side of uh, coaching my eldest son right now, uh, tackle football. So that's been kind of fun. What uh, what what age is he? He's uh, eight. Playing? Must He's be eight. a lot of fun. I don't think the other, most of the other teams probably don't have NFL veterans as their head coaches. So what? Uh, so then I got to ask, what kind of offense are you running? We're running. Uh, it's kind of like a eleven personnel. It's kind of funny at this age. It's like herding cats. It's like it's the craziest. <laughs> You know, just getting the step the right way is like a victory. And, um, but it's fun. The kids are fun. They have fun with it. Um, I think we're six and one right now. Like we're doing well. He's playing well. So it's been fun so far. Is he an old lineman? No, it's kind of funny. He, uh, going into the year, I was teaching him all this old line stuff, kind of how to block, <laughs> how to use your hands. And, uh, the first practice we had, we started doing all these agility drills and like races, and he was the fastest. And so I go, oh, we'll stick him at running back. And I'm like, running back? What are you talking about? And so, I mean, he's 95 pounds. He's one of the bigger kids, if not the biggest, and was one of the fastest. So, like, we have to put the ball in his hands. So I'm like, all right, sweet. My wife hated it because she didn't want to get hurt. So he's been playing some running back, some tight end, and he plays DN on defense, kind of containing the football. So he's having fun with it. That's so cool. Well, Craig, we're, we're happy your wife is doing well. Yes, absolutely. Thanks. Um, I love that your son's playing football because I think everyone should play football for a number of, of reasons. Uh, thanks for coming on. I mean, I think your insights in the O-line uh, is always super helpful of the team is always, I know you and I watch very seriously the Badgers. Um, and you know, I just, I just want people to know, like it's trans we're still in transition. Yeah. I mean, that's really what it is. It, it it's not the NFL where guys have three-year contracts and they're going to be fired if they don't do it. it. Fickle has, what, a five-year contract that we can't pay out? We don't have any money. Um, yeah. So, like, and, and not only that, I think he's a good coach. Like, Let's let him cook coach. a little. I think he's a good coach. I think when when all that went down with, with Paul, when he got fired, during the year, I'm like, I either want – I forget who the other guy was. I'm like, him or Fickle to come in and lead the program. When they hired – uh, Coach Fick, I'm like, that's great. I cannot wait. I'm looking forward to it. Obviously, the offense what not as what, what anyone expected. I think even them, too. It needs a time to improve. I think it will. I think they're getting the guys in recruiting. I think they're doing a good job. I think a lot of the stuff, a lot of the sky is falling that's going on in terms of stuff on the Twitter. It's like we're four games in. You know, just everyone needs to just take a step back and relax. They're going to get it going. I – have faith that the coaches are going to get going and I'm looking forward to the rest of the year. You know, I'm really excited to see these guys, a lot of good players on that team. I really want them to have the most success, you know, guys like Hunter and those guys, you know, you know, they're all seniors. They're all their last years. I want that, want them to have as someone who had not, a not good senior year team wise, you know, we went seven and five in the regular season. I want these guys to have as much success as they can. Cause it's no worse feeling than, you know, having your senior year kind of, not go as it did. So, you know, and I think they're going to do it. I think looking ahead, not to, not that they do it, but we can look ahead and I think they have a road ahead that they can win a ton of games, you know, you know, for the rest of the year.
if they play up to their ceiling, I think that for sure. So I still we you know, did like, play top. They were, we lost to the two. There is USC top ten now. I think they're they lost like, to, I think they're eleven. Yeah, they were eleven last week, and we lost to uh, number four, who's probably number one now, Alabama. Yeah, like, they they beat now. Georgia. Like Alabama, you beat Georgia. They're the number one team. In there. Yeah. So we never played two no. top eleven teams back to back. No. I mean. I, and competed with them, at least for a while. People look at the score and be like, no, we didn't. No, we definitely did. They just played four quarters and we didn't play four quarters. Yeah. They also have that That's f- what's exciting. 17 year old on the, on, the, on the field that just, that kid's unbelievable. Yeah. 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 So, uh, what are you going to do? What we're going to do is keep hanging out with Craig and uh, all of our other Badger friends here on Believe in Badgers, uh, uh, part of the Believe Network, presented by BetOnline.ag and Oak Bridge Wealth Management. We appreciate everyone here tuning in. Please like, subscribe, rate, review, unsubscribe, resubscribe, re rate, re review. Uh, tell a friend to tell a friend. Um, Find us on YouTube, all the podcast platforms, and everything good like that. So, thanks for tuning in. To, in to, uh, thank you for tuning in. Can't talk mm-hmm. today. Until next time, on Wisconsin. Yeah, create fake handles and like us also. Yeah, why like- not? <laughs>